This is the second part of a two-part series on the history of money and central banking. If you haven't seen the first part, I would recommend you give it a listen. The link is provided below. We start the second part looking at the rapid westward expansion of the United States in the 1800s and how banking helped facilitate this unprecedented period of economic growth. First, I want a quick comment on the symbiosis that exists between economists and the Federal Reserve. In the United States, there is a pervasive tradition in the schools of economics that pertains more to comfortable conformity than conservatism. It is occasionally called the Belmont Syndrome, the desire for faculty members to commute to and from work with as little disturbance from controversial thought as possible. Indeed, it does serve some benefit, as academia would not be well served if every participant believed he had an obligation to change the world. However, it should also be recognized that this default to conformity has been of major benefit to the Federal Reserve, and this syndrome is not just restricted to the field of economics. Economics, and indeed the larger scientific zeitgeist, must be approached with discriminating regards to what is commonly taught and believed, because some people indeed have a conflict of interest. We now enter into a new subject, that of a war, but not of the regular garden variety. Rather than barrages of shells, bullets, and bloody carnage, we enter a war of vitriolic words, heroic speeches between the bankers and those that wish to destroy them. This is also known as the Bank War. With westward expansion of America, the War of 1812 and post-war resurgence in demand and economic boom, freed from the discipline of the first bank, hundreds of private banks cropped up like weeds after a rainstorm. From 88 in 1811 to 208 in 1815, and notes in circulation doubling from 45 million in 1812 to 100 million in 1817. With the capture of Washington in 1814, the banks outside New England suspended redemption of their note allowing free issuance. The notes of banks in New England remained redeemable and were considered at a premium to those of other banks, lending without restraint. Banks of Baltimore and Washington notes traded at 20% discounts and western states at even a higher discount of 50%. These were accompanied with numerous counterfeits in circulation. Banks cropped up everywhere, even in small hamlets. That the first bank had disappeared at such an opportune time, when its abilities were required for wartime economy, seems most interesting. This general state of financial chaos primed the stage for a new charter, which was drafted in 1814 by... Stephen Girard, David Parrish, and John Jacob Astor. In 1816, it was chartered. The post-war boom and bubble had to be brought under control. This was done when Langdon Sheaves replaced William Jones as head of the bank in 1819. He instituted a policy of austere credit contraction and foreclosure. The boom collapsed dramatically. Debtors closed out and bankruptcy skyrocketed. This was the first of five great panics in intervals of about 20 years. Here, we see the potential for gross profit in controlling the supply of credit. In 1823, Sheaves was replaced by Nicholas Biddle, a man of considerable intellect, who had been declined his degree upon graduating from the University of Pennsylvania because he was thought too young at only 13 years of age. Under Biddle, 20 or so new branches of the bank were established, and loans and investment greatly expanded. Payments to the bank were only accepted in notes of other banks redeemable in hard currency. Biddle implemented numerous policies to keep the private banks honest, including continuous testing of other banks by prompt redemption of their notes. He went so far as to require each note issued to be signed personally by the president of each bank, which, with the primitive pens available at the time, limited the issuance of notes to not more than 1,500 per day, and also had the benefit of keeping the presidents occupied with mundane activity, constantly. This led President Andrew Jackson to observe that Biddle has told us that most of the state banks exist by his forbearance. Biddle had quite a penchant for arrogance. He gloated of his power as a banker and suggested on numerous occasions that his power compared to that of the president of the United States. Biddle had opposition from the hard money men and establishment, the eastern bankers that resented his discipline and the hard money anti-bank views of Jefferson and now Jackson. The latter had found a sympathetic ear amongst the common man, who felt that paper money, regardless of whom it came, was a device through which they were defrauded through higher prices and inflation. Although the charter of the second bank did not expire until 1836, anticipatory controversy started in 1832. The pro-bank forces in Congress, led by Henry Clay, passed a new bill renewing the charter. This, Jackson vetoed with a stinging message, highlighting the dangers to liberty and independence of a central bank, which allows foreign ownership. Is there no danger to our liberty and independence in a bank that in its nature has so little to bind it to our country?
The president of the bank has told us that most of the state banks exist by his forbearance. Should its influence become concentrated in the hands of a self-elected directory whose interests are identified with those of foreign stockholders, will there not be cause to tremble for the purity of our elections in peace and for the independence of our country in war? Their power would be great whenever they might chose to exert it. But if this monopoly were regularly renewed every 15 or 20 years on terms proposed by themselves, they might seldom in peace put forth their strength to influence elections or control the affairs of the nation. Should the stock of the bank principally pass into the hands of the subjects of a foreign country, and we should unfortunately become involved in a war with that country, what would be our condition? All its operations within would be in aid of the hostile fleets and armies without. Controlling our currency, receiving our public monies, and holding thousands of our citizens in dependence, it would be more formidable and dangerous than the naval and military powers of the enemy. Jackson was quite the formidable foe. He understood the power of a bank that allowed foreign ownership, foreign interests of such power that could plunge the United States into war whenever they desired, such as when the bank's charter was not renewed. He opposed the bank as a monopoly, a monster which, as Biddle claimed, had the power to rival that of the state. Nicknamed Old Hickory, Andrew Jackson was famous for defeating the English in 1812 at the Battle of New Orleans and notable for having survived an assassination attempt in 1835, when both pistols of the assailant failed to shoot. Winning the election a second time, more decisively than the first, with his vitriolic attack against the banks, Jackson moved promptly to remove all government deposits from the bank. Biddle, now disenfranchised but not disemboldened by the stand of Old Hickory, drew on his still significant power as a banker to suddenly contract loans with an eye of precipitating a crisis. A minor recession occurred, and Biddle succeeded only in crystallizing support for Jackson. In the latter part of the 1800s and into the 1900s, Alexander's actions were viewed as a villainous act to destroy the great experiment of central banking. But this reception has largely warmed since the middle of the 20th century, as the conventional wisdom of bankers has again come into question. Jackson's rehabilitated reputation has been ascribed both perception and virtue to the common man, leaving a certain contrasting warmth in its wake. Jackson fundamentally viewed paper as the instrument of the devil. In destroying the bank, he got not hard money, but the softest of all, an explosion of new banks and an avalanche of new private notes. But it was these loans that his voters most wanted. Had Jackson succeeded in establishing hard money, he would have likely been reviled by the small aspiring folk of the frontier. Historians? Pondering whether Jackson's financial policy was right or wrong must allow for a third possibility, that maybe he did not fully understand economics as much as he thought. According to legend, as the British drew nearer during the Battle of New Orleans, he had given the historic command, elevate them guns a little lower. Whether this was an attempt to raise morale of his cold and embattled troops, a sensible action to lower expectations, or to aim not for the brain of his opponents but rather their hearts, remains uncertain. Biddle's bank was rechartered by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and later went bankrupt speculating on cotton, suspending payments in 1839. He died while under litigation. The monetary history of the United States in the years after 1832 was rather chaotic. The cycles of bank creation, excessive credit, resulting crashes and bank failures, followed by Civil War greenbacks, more greenbacks, and the partially successful push to make cheap silver coinage combined to make the financial system of the United States the worst in the civilized world, according to Andrew Carnegie. However, this was not the only side to the story. Those who spoke despairingly of the monetary aberrations of the United States in the last century couldn't help but mention the excellent and somewhat contradictory economic growth which accompanied such a wretched monetary policy. Such a combination had never before been seen. Either the monetary arrangements had a beneficial effect on economic growth, or no effect at all. From 1832 until 1930, a dual monetary system existed. Which system prevailed in each jurisdiction relied greatly on the predilections of the type of economy it served. Stability of a sort was maintained by the mutual inability to ultimately destroy the system of the other. For the established parts of the country, primarily in the east and south, redeemable notes of increasingly reliable banks policed by federal regulation. Redemption was made regularly and checked by said regulations. But in the newer parts of the country, there was no restriction on the creation of banks or of the issuance of notes for their deposits. This was known as the Great Compromise. No central bank tested the re redeemability of notes, and state regulations that existed were enforced only lightly. As civilization approached the hamlets of Indiana and Michigan, banks came in tow. Notes issued by these banks were used as a local currency, often with deposits from investment of the East, which allowed the farmer to buy equipment and feed for his lands. If the farmer turned a profit, the loans were paid off, and the bank survived. If not, some Eastern investor would be left with a fistful of worthless dollars. While it was an arrangement often viewed with great distaste by Eastern bankers and merchants, it was not altogether unprofitable. 
the clever investors of the East could uh, learn to distinguish between the reputable and less reputable banks in their notes, declining or forcing discount on dubious notes. Losses occurred, this is true, but also significant profits on the back of expanding economic productivity. The monetary anarchy of the frontier provided far greater access to credit than a more orderly and established system would have. The price of such a system was repeated cycles of boom and bust, and failing of the new banks. These were known as the panics. The end of the Second Bank of the United States completely liberalized the chartering and regulation of banks and placed them in the hands of the states, or even in the hands of the locales which they served. Between 1830 and 1836, the number of banks doubled from 330 to 713. Note circulation increased from 61 to $140 million. Deposits of tangible coinage only showed a moderate gain from 22 to $40 million. Expansion at this time was accomplished by two new legal designs. One was that of state-owned banks. State-owned banks made to furnish loans in its own newly printed paper came into direct conflict with the constitutional prohibition on the issue of money by states. The state of Kentucky succinctly proved this point by providing only so much for the new bank as the cost of the presses and paper, all else to be paid for with the newly issued notes. It was now evident that the constitution could be sidestepped in the key area of money. Chief Justice John Marshall held the creation of bills on credit by state banks to be unconstitutional, but this was repealed in 1837 by the full court upon his death. The second important new legal development was that of free banking. The bank had been ruled not to be a corporation by state legislatures. Corporations required special charter from the state at this time, requiring public support something that has since been removed to prevent them from becoming the tyrannical behemoths we see today. States did not make rules to the amount of reserves to be kept, but these were enforced with great variation from state to state. A bank in Massachusetts with a circulation of $500,000 was later found to have a modest $86 in reserve. Usually it took a large local failure to coerce adequate enforcement. Michigan banking in the 1830s required a 30% reserve requirement in gold and silver, and commissioners were put in circulation to perform regular inspection. However, it was possible to game the system by moving deposits from bank to bank as as the commissioners arrived. Sometimes a bank would be founded in a remote location and notes issued to borrowers in the hope that such remoteness would discourage inspection or redemption of the notes. Many banks of this period were managed responsibly. Even amongst those that failed, many did so after an honest and useful effort that stimulated the local economy and made worthy men established on farms or in business. In 1836, the federal government decreed that purchase of public lands must be made in hard money. This was long believed to have put a stymie on lending and bank creation as purchase of public lands for agriculture was the backbone of growth at the time. In 1837, a panic ensued, though there is not clear grounds to believe any correlation existed. In response, regulation was tightened greatly, and the number of banks declined from 1840 to 1847 along with note circulation. By the time of the Civil War, the number of notes in circulation dwarfed the number of coins 10 to 1 that the First Bank of Amsterdam had to contend with in 1609. Over 7,000 different notes were in circulation. To accompany this, an estimated 5,000 counterfeit notes were concurrently in circulation. Anyone hoping to do successful business had to regularly purchase notes on the good and bad species in circulation, known as note reporters or counterfeit detectors. The occurrence of the Civil War and exigencies which were urged against the chaotic system that was the state banks. While a new central bank would not be entertained, a new system of banks chartered by and under heavy regulation of the federal government was a possibility. In 1863, at the strong behest of the Secretary of the Treasury and Congress, the National Bank Act was passed, establishing a new system of national National banks. To regulate note issue, the banks had to purchase federal bonds and deposit these at the treasury. Notes could be issued up to 90% of the value of these federal bonds. If a bank capsized, the notes could be redeemed for bonds with appropriate margin for full recuperation. Put simply, the bank would be required to purchase federal bonds and provide capital to the state, and the state would pay interest and ultimately the full sum of the bond upon annulation. Said purchase bonds would then be used to back the new currency and could be redeemed for bonds if so required. The quantity of bank notes issued would depend on the number of federal bonds available. If the government was profligate, so would the volume of bond securities and therefore volume of notes. To protect against this, Congress limited the first issue to $300 million. 
What was particularly strange about this was the economic circumstances following the Civil War. For several years, the federal government ran a heavy surplus but could not pay off its public debt, for in doing so would remove from existence the bonds which backed the national banknotes. To pay off the debt was effectively to destroy the monetary supply. Then in 1865, Congress was persuaded to do away with state-issued notes. A tax of 10% was levied against all state bank-issued notes, which was perhaps the most impressive gesture that the power of tax is indeed the power to destroy. To counteract this, note issuance declined, instead being replaced by use of deposits and checks. In providing a loan, the bank would provide a deposit to a lender, which was then paid out in checks. Deposit creation was significantly more prudent than notes, as checks would often return promptly to the bank so that the recipient could transfer the deposit to his own bank. In this, was an overleveraged bank would quickly find itself insolvent. This was in stark contrast to notes, which may never return to the bank as they circulated. However, insolvencies of small state banks still occurred when they expanded their deposits of loans too quickly. In the years before the Civil War, the hard currency of the United States was gold. The opportunity for arbitrage existed for some time between gold and silver dollars, such that it was profitable to use to buy gold, which was then minted, could be used to buy incrementally more silver than originally outlaid, so on and so forth. This drove silver out of circulation and into the hands of the profiteers, so that after 1837, the money of the states was effectively gold. As the war commenced, by June 1861, public expenditures reached $67 million. A year later, they ballooned to $475 million. Expenditure in the final year of 1865 was $1.3 billion, not matched again until 1917. Reluctance existed to resort to paper money and indeed to taxation, which Salmon P. Chase, the Treasury Secretary during the war, had this to say. No more certainly fatal expedient for impoverishing the masses and discrediting the government of any country can be well devised than that of fiat paper. The innovation of the income tax, although short-lived, raised revenues in 1865 to $334 million, but this still fell massively short of the $1.3 billion spent. Ultimately, paper was required to pay these debts, in addition to selling of government war bonds. From 1862, selling of war bonds became a major enterprise and was indeed so successful among the public that the initial sum was oversubscribed. In 1862, an issue of 150 million of notes printed in green ink was authorized by an acquiescent Salmon Chase. Ultimately, 450 million of these greenbacks were issued. Greenbacks have been viewed by many historians as tinder for the voracious flames of inflation. However, not much alternative was available, for even bonds bought in money from deposits or hoards of the public, which when spent also contributed to demand and thus to inflation. Taxation could have occurred earlier and at a higher rate, but the greenbacks would still have been required in some form. The inflation that resulted was not as severe as thought. Prices doubled in 1864 from their original levels in 1860, which, while uncomfortable, was not unbearable. Considering the country was torn in two, and the Union was supporting an army of a million men at its peak, this cannot be considered poor performance by any means. The story was altogether different in the South. Taxes were vehemently opposed in addition to the horrors of war. Taxes by the Confederates were largely ineffective in yield. The Confederates had to resort to excessive note issuance to the tune of a billion dollars by the end of the war, with an eye-watering increase of prices of about 90 times that of pre-war levels, but wages only 10 times. It is often said that the failure of the Confederacy lied in its poor approach to war financing. However, this is simply not correct. The Confederacy was a smaller territory than the Union, and much less developed and industrialized. It was blockaded by the Union Navy and had fielded an army which at most numbered 600,000 in the field for four years, with gold and silver resources of around $40 million. This was a mere fraction, that of the Union. The miracle was not that it lost, but how it fought on for so long. The Greenbacks began retirement in 1866 at a rate of $10 million for the first six months, and $4 million per month thereafter. It was an unpopular policy, as the Union now had to pay for reconstruction in the South. Government expenditures remained high. Wheat had fallen from $3 a bushel to $2.50 from the end of the war in 1868, and to $1.50 in 1869. Soldiers returning home from war to their farms were amongst those hardest hit from the shortage of currency. The retirement of Greenbacks was stopped in 1868 and a further issuance of $400 million was passed but vetoed by President Ulysses Grant. The question fell to the electorate and the Greenback Party, but this was unsuccessful. The total circulation of Greenbacks stayed at $346 million of the original $450 million for decades to come. 1878 marked the high point of relevance of the Greenback. At this point, the world's focus shifted back to silver. On the international gold standard, 
In 1867, the European states met in Paris and agreed to make gold the standard upon which their currencies and payments between each other would be based. America followed suit. In 1873, Congress enacted legislation to drop the silver dollar from the mints. In 1879, the remaining greenbacks were made convertible into gold and gold alone. National bank notes being convertible into greenbacks were now also fully exchangeable into gold. The return to a gold standard was achieved with little difficulty. The rapid expansion of currency during the war had now been offset by the voracious speed at which industry and agriculture was expanding. Paper circulation, once large in relation to the volume of transactions, was now small, and prices were back to pre-war levels. The transfer of currencies from gold and silver reserve to gold alone in Europe had the effect of causing silver prices to fall, especially in the case of the Prussian banks and their vast silver reserves for gold. In the 1870s, large deposits of silver were discovered in Nevada, further lowering prices. Conflicting reports allege that the push to drop the silver dollar was spearheaded by an English financier, Ernest Seed, who had received funds from English bankers to bribe Congress. However, a congressional inquiry in 1892 found written evidence from Said advocating for maintaining the silver dollar. The conspiracy later expanded to be that of the Jewish banking cabal. It was more likely that the silver was dropped as a reserve because all other developed countries were dropping it at the same time. A political battle now commenced between the silver proponents and greenback supporters. As before, the free money greenbacks were supported by the newer expanding states. They held much support in Congress, and the silver hard money men had the president. In 1878, new legislation was enacted by Congress to purchase 2 to $4 million of silver a month at market price to be minted into coins. The soft money men hoped to placate the hard moneyers with this, but it was unsuccessful. Agitation continued not for the minting of a little silver, but all the silver that could be had. The silver men were staunchly religious, and felt that the cause of silver dollars was that of a religious one. In 1890, silver purchases were further liberalized. Treasury notes issued for silver purchase were redeemable in either gold or silver, gold being slightly more advantageous. Gresham's law applied once again, and gold was withdrawn preferentially and hoarded or used for overseas trade, using notes used by the government to buy silver. Gold disappeared from circulation, and in 1893 there was a run on gold stocks held by the Treasury. In an attempt to relieve the deflationary pressures of a gold standard, a silver alternative was incorporated, for which gold presented an opportunity in arbitrage and overseas trade. In 1900, cosmetic legislation on coinage and note issuance further affirmed the commitment to gold. Some purists date the adoption of the gold standard in America to 1900 as a result. The 1900 law loosened reserve requirements, allowing the reputable national banks to issue notes on the full 100% of government bonds deposited in the treasury. What followed was a prompt increase in the note circulation of the central banks. Over the next eight years it doubled, and this was praised by men of finance to be necessary in facilitating growing commerce in the country. As we approach the turn of the century, we also approach the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age, stretching from the 1890s to the first decade of the 1900s, was a fantastic time to be rich. No income tax existed, for it had been abolished after the Civil War. There was an unprecedented period of economic growth. Even for the poor, real wage growth was 60% between 1860 and 1890. As it was easy for those who had wealth to profit from interest on their money or appreciation in land prices, the problem of the rich turned to what agreeable activities they could invest their time. Travel from America to Europe became a prerogative of the rich, as only the poor could not afford to travel. The ability of the rich and their acolytes to see social virtue in causes which serve their interest, and to depict as foolish or immoral those which did not, has never been better demonstrated than in their support of gold and condemnation of paper. The rich felt little interest in economic growth that did not serve their own ends, or the arcane mechanics which paper could exert in raising or indeed crashing the wealth of individuals. It was in 1907 that language, like many other things, started to become the servant of economic interest. Up until 1907, bank runs were called panics. But such a word was rather shocking, and undermined the confidence of businessmen and bankers. Thus, economic sekbats were changed from panics to simply crises. However, with the emergence of Karl Marx's works on the capitalist crises, the word fell out of use by the 1920s, being replaced with a much gentler euphemism, that of depression. When the Depression turned out to be one of the worst economic events in history, recession made its feature. One can even gain an advanced degree in economics studying business cycles and sideways movement, such is the progression of economic terms. The panics of the 1800s in 1819, 1837, 57, 73, 84, 93, and 1907 happened so regularly that it was thought that this wave-like behavior was natural in capitalist economies. 
Recognizable similarities existed in all panics. First, an expansion of business activity centered around one dominant form of investment, such as canals or railroads that helped tame the geography of the land to benefit greater trade. Sensible expansion gave way to speculation of insensible and unsustainable expansion, causing prices to rise rapidly. Between 1819 and 1837, speculation was predominantly that of land. In 1836, it was that of canal construction. From 1857 to the end of the century, it was the great boom in railway construction and speculation on the securities that facilitated railroad construction. When considering the effect of these panics on the workforces, the advancement of agricultural technology had great effect. After the 1819 panic, of the 3 million workers in the United States, 2.1 million were employed in agriculture. By 1870, this had dwindled to around 1 million. By the Great Depression, it was less than 500,000. During such crashes, prices fall, men may lose their farms and become bankrupt, but few agricultural workers become unemployed. By 1907, speculation was shifting to common stocks in general, as was the speculative boom of the Roaring Twenties. By 1929, the limitless potentials of technology had captured the attention of the public, and with it the idea that a peculiar financial genius existed that could engineer spectacular wealth from speculation. Speculation is the phenomenon that occurs when investors buy assets on the pretense that they will rise accordingly to some underlying fundamental principle. As the price rises, this theory is only reinforced in the eyes of the investors, who are further encouraged to invest more and drive prices ever higher. Eventually, the shrewder investors, their mind not clouded, with irrational notions of endless wealth, exit the market, and the gains slow and suddenly reverse. Two factors that came into effect in the 20th century worked to reduce the impact of crashes on prices and worker compensation. These are the corporation, which exists with sufficient power to defend prices, and the union, which defends wage rates. These are two major buffering factors that slow sudden changes in both price and compensation. During the Depression, prices of goods and services fell, accompanied by wages. This reduction in income for the business and fall in income of the wage earner, when coupled with the deflationary reluctance to spend money as it gains in value, is what caused distress during the Depression. Banks played a major factor in the creation and collapse of the bubble, but the collapse of banks and panics prior to the Depression was a fraction of that which occurred in the 1930s. In 1893, some 500 banks suspended redemptions, these mostly being smaller local banks of the frontier, but the larger banks in the East typically weathered the panics with deposits of hard money intact. This assumption was continued into the Depression when in 1931 the bankers met in New York. George L. Harrison, then governor of the New York Federal Reserve, said, Many of us Wall Street bankers thought that the failure of small banks in the community could be isolated. But the isolation of the Great Compromise, that of the cowboy paper banks of the West and hard money banks of the East, had been evaporating over the early years of the 20th century. More country banks were keeping deposits in the New York and other big city eastern banks. When the small banks felt the strain, they drew on deposits held by the big banks. Speculation had become less of a local and more of a national pastime. New York had also been developing a new bank, the State Trust, one significantly less regulated than traditional banks. They had had much greater growth than the traditional banks during the speculation of the early 20th century. Between 1930 and 1934, some 9,000 banks suspended redemptions. It is not just the depositors and owners of banks that lose their money during a bank failure. There is also a shrinkage in the monetary supply. This 20-fold evaporation of monetary supply when compared to panics of the previous century, in addition to the increased involvement of country banks with the big banks, is thought responsible for the devastating impacts of the Depression. The attitude of investors in the new world, a place rich in resources in a way never before seen, lended itself to speculative insanity far more so than any other region in the old world. Fortunes could be made overnight and lost just as quickly. The way in which the Federal Reserve is treated by teachers of economic theory is nothing short of reverence bordering on religious. On no matter is their instruction of the young in the subtle wisdom and benevolence of established institutions more admiring, or more successful. In contrast, corporations are taught as flawed entities of monopolistic designs. Trade unions, by contrast, are taught to interfere with the market, and governments are taught to be imperfect tools of economic guidance. The Federal Reserve, however, is treated with much reverence, even when examining its mistakes, these being interesting errors of judgment to be examined respectfully and not critically, to determine why men of such economic wisdom were wrong. Other sources have described the Open Market Committee of the Fed as the most powerful group of private citizens in America and this is close to the truth. The Fed was the product of Paul M. Warburg and Nelson Aldrich beginning in 1910. 
Warburg was undoubtedly the more skilled financier, and was to correctly predict the disastrous crash of the out-of-control bull market of the 20s, much to the wrath of Wall Street. Much care was made to avoid the word bank in the proposal, which had become a word of unwholesome connotation. Aldrich was known by the opposition to be attempting to strengthen the shadowy power of the New York Money Trust. In 1912, he introduced legislation to establish a National Reserve Association with 15 regional branches. These would hold the reserves of the participating banks. The banks could turn to the National Reserve Association for loans in time of emergency. The opposition, staunchly opposed to a single reserve authority, accepted it. Woodrow Wilson, becoming president in 1913, was to accept the opposition's view that a central bank was necessary and sign the Federal Reserve Act into law in Christmas 1913. The 12 regional Federal Reserves each had a board of nine members, six to be selected by the participating banks and three by the government. Member banks were required to maintain a specified reserve against their deposits, a third of which was to be kept at their regional reserve. Reserves could be gold, silver, greenbacks or treasury notes. The membership fee of each bank was 6% of their capital. Against its deposits, the Federal Reserve Bank was required to maintain a 35% reserve of lawful money. The system was to be the place of deposit for government funds. Unlike the Bank of England, the Fed could not directly do business with the public. The old compromise still existed. The good banks for the financial community and sound currency they wanted, for the still expanding frontier, casual banking that served the interests of agriculturalists, whose deposits were created on small or exiguous reserves. It was the small country banks that were handled in a way somewhat illogical. The reserves required by each bank participating in the Fed were dependent on the size of the cities they served. 18% for the largest and 12% for the smallest. Banks of Chicago and New York required 18% reserves. The frontier banks were allowed to operate at 12% reserves, something that in hindsight was very reckless. The interest for such an arrangement was that of the banks themselves. More lending produces more profits. As of March 2020, these reserve requirements were reduced to zero for all banks by the Fed, which when compared to history is a foreboding measure indeed. Recent inflation has little to do with the so-called cost of living crisis and more to do with rampant monetary expansion. The monetary velocity of these newly printed dollars has been low, however, for the time being, which is the sole reason that crippling inflation has not yet occurred. However, not all banks chose to join the system. By 1929, 65% of all banks were still outside the system, and they were the smaller banks. That said, of the 35% in the system, they controlled two-thirds of all bank resources. The Fed was a party of the big banks. Just as the new Fed system was getting underway, the US was moving into war. It is a common cliché that this was the Fed's first crisis, and it met it well. This is absolute nonsense. The various regional Federal Reserves bought government bonds and helped sell them as the Treasury required. Where private peacetime loans can be refused, government loans in war cannot. In this, the Fed has no power. In the first few years of the system, the regional banks took their autonomy seriously, especially the New York Fed under Benjamin Strong. The Fed in Washington, however, was hobbled by the slight power afforded to it by the Federal Reserve Act. It lacked prestige, and in time, simple competence as well. The government officials on each Fed board were paid government salaries, in stark contrast to the bankers who were paid banker salaries. This did not bode well, as a man's worth at that time was seen to come from his salary. Later on, the trend emerged of moving from government board position to presidential banker position at double the salary, which continues to this day. The government appointees to the board typically lack the expertise of the bankers in the more complex mechanisms of banking, and they did not properly grasp the nature of companion step, open market operations, the buying or selling of government securities. The sale of bonds puts cash into the reserves of the Fed, reducing the reserves that allow a bank to further lend. This requires the banks to either reduce lending or borrow from the Fed at a new and higher rediscount rate to continue lending. It was this principle that the government appointees on each board failed to fully grasp, denying the most powerful capacity available to that of a central banker. It was then in 1935 that Roosevelt amalgamated the regional banks into one. The functions of the district federal reserve banks became largely mechanical and advisory. Today, the 12 district federal banks and their buildings serve as simply branch operations. Their mechanical tasks compose of clearing checks, routine movement of currency, and management of government financial transactions. And this is indeed useful, and these transactions are vast. But the illusion of autonomy and importance still survives, as seen in pamphlets published in 1971 by the Federal Reserve of Richmond, Virginia, with the board of directors deliberating around a table. The the economic textbooks of today work to maintain this illusion without exception. On the outbreak of the war in 1914, the major participants of Germany, France, Britain, and Austria suspended redemptions in gold and silver and went off the gold standard. For a hundred years, Europeans had been investing in the United States, and six billion of a 
American securities were held abroad. If these were liquidated for cash, American gold reserves would quickly evaporate. This was true, for the Fed began business that autumn with a mere $200 million in gold in its vaults. Fears of such liquidations led to a dumping of securities in the New York market, and the dollar fell from $5 to $7 per pound sterling. For a short time, arbitrage existed, where dollars could be redeemed for gold, and the gold shipped over to Britain to buy sterling at largely the pre-war price, and then shipped back to buy dollars. This was dampened by the German U-boat navy, however. The New York Stock Exchange closed down in autumn on the expectation of panic selling, but reopened several months later in December, when the financial experts realized that there was an appeal to a country so far displaced from the overtures of war. While it was closed, a clandestine exchange operated with typewritten notes on closing prices. These were seen to be largely the same as pre-war prices, which had led to the exchange reopening soon after. Similarly, the calculation of gold prices was seen to be off, and the Bank of England opened a branch on the east coast of Canada to receive gold and reduce the risk of ocean shipment. America, being seen as a safe haven, rapidly started to fill with foreign gold, from $1.5 billion in 1914 to $3 billion at the end of 1917. This largely destroyed the gold standard in countries which it fled. Gold influxes were partially for secure deposit, but also for the essential wartime resources required by the belligerents. Britain in particular could never supply all the shells it needed to shoot aimlessly across no man's land, as current concepts of war dictated. America was initially neutral, but Britain's naval control made it too risky for the Germans and Austrians to receive supply from the Americans. The effect of gold outflows from Europe was to remove reserves of French and England banks on into paper that could be converted. France had made an edict for all citizens to turn in their gold, estimated to be worth some $1.2 billion, for paper for the war effort. Much of the French government's disappointment, only $200 million worth of gold was received, the rest wisely concluding that they may never see their gold again. Eventually, there was much more paper than actual gold, which was to cause problems if redemption ever occurred. The massive influx of gold to America raised the prospect of something strange to the advocates of a gold standard, that of inflation. Gold invested and paid from Europe greatly expanded the reserves of the Fed, allowing for more credit expansion. This was prevented by allowing reserves to accumulate in excess of legal requirement. The limit of loans was instead set by the demands of borrowers and not by reserve requirements. It was not until 1917, as America entered the war, that the gold standard was suspended. American loans had replaced the gold which Britain and allies used to purchase goods. Instead, gold started to flow out to the neutrals, leading to the gold standard suspension. American citizens were still allowed to redeem paper money for gold in the home country, however. World War I was, domestically speaking, a hard money war, something rare and exceptional indeed. Taxation then made a feature. It is estimated that 30% of American costs in World War I were furnished from tax revenues. The rest was made up using methods similar to those of previous wars. Instead of money printing, however, the Treasury could now borrow from the Federal Reserve. As a consequence, the Fed got newly printed bonds and the Treasury got newly printed reserve notes. In effect, this only differed from greenbacks in a superficial form. The debt interest on greenbacks was the inflation and devaluation of money held by all participants. For this new method, it was interest the government had to pay to the Fed for the bonds the Fed held. The public were encouraged to buy government bonds for the war effort. So-called war bonds promoted saving and reduced spending, lessening the inflationary pressures of new currency. Some buyers were even encouraged to take loans from banks to buy bonds, which were then deposited as collateral in the banks. In the post-war years, a difference in interest rates made holding onto the bonds profitable, and people kept their bonds and repaid the loans, which made the post-war slump in consumer expenditure marginally worse. This was not noticed in the heavy euphoria of war, however. However, nor did anyone question why such an indirect route to buying excess bonds would be encouraged. The reality of the Fed is less clear. According to economic textbooks, when the Federal Reserve Act was passed in 1913, it was said to have sprung from the Panic of 1907 with its epidemic of banking failures. The country was fed up with the chaotic state of unstable private banking. But seven years later, there was a banking collapse, and the most devastating of all collapses in 1930. The evidence does not support the idea that the Federal Reserve prevented, or even reduced, the ongoing occurrence of bank failures. In the 20 years prior to founding, 1,750 banks failed. In the 20 years after it ended, 
the so-called anarchy of private banking, there was 15,500. There is much evidence, which even orthodox professional opinion does not reject, that policies the Fed made it in helping finance antecedent speculation and intensifying the ensuing contraction in 1921 and in the 1930s. As may be recalled, the function of a central bank is to restrain lending during the boom and serve as lender of last resort during bust. However, the Federal Reserve did not act as the lender of last resort during the Depression. Rather, it was the newly created and largely anonymous Reconstruction Finance Corporation. When irresponsible lending was brought to an end and correct supervision imposed on the banks in 1933, it was not the Fed that provided insurance for depositors, but rather the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation that performed the task. It was found that even if money was provided to banks to lend, this did not ensure their usage. As a consequence, it became necessary for the government to make spending not permissive, but assured. A sufficiently bad depression was beyond the power of the Federal Reserve. It was necessary for the government to borrow and finance public works to restart the economy, accompanied once again by the overtures of war. That said, 1963 marked one of the highest periods of inflation in the United States history outside of wartime. The Federal Board of Governors met and published a small volume on its purposes. It said, Today, it is generally understood that the primary purpose of the Federal Reserve System is to foster growth at high levels of employment and a stable dollar. The Open Market Committee met repeatedly on the problem, but the inflation continued. When inflation slowed, unemployment grew. Today, this is known as stagflation, and much is said about its causes, but little is conclusive. It may arise from expansion of the monetary supply at a rate greater than intrinsic economic growth. It is a recent phenomenon, and it continued through the 1960s until the 1980s, and was likely worsened by the oil shocks of 1973 and 1979, when Middle Eastern oil suppliers voted to unanimously raise oil prices. The system of the Federal Reserve has provided some objectively beneficial aspects, however. It brought into existence a highly efficient method for cashing and clearing checks, which no longer charge for the cashing of checks at other banks. No Federal Reserve employees were ever found to have been embezzling funds, although something must attribute it to the fact that tangible money is so rarely handed by its employees. Returning back to the First World War, inflation did make an appearance in the States, mostly in 1916 and 1917 prior to entry into the war. By 1918, wholesale prices had risen 350%. Britain and Germany felt similar inflation and enacted rationing and price controls. Some price controls and rationing was encouraged in the States, starting in 1917, but consequences of non-compliance were largely limited to the charge of being called unpatriotic. After the war, only the States returned to the gold standard. The purpose of the gold standard was to unite the economic performance of trading nations, which was achieved during its brief rule. However, it could also inflict significant economic distress in nations with depleted gold reserves and little gold deposits to exploit. If business were good in Britain, Brit goods would flow in and good gold would flow out. This would deplete reserves and raise interest rates for credit, tightening the money supply and stymieing economic growth. The gold flowing into other trading nations' reserves would then have an effect of expanding credit and leading to inflation. Outstanding financial obligations to foreign nations on a gold-backed currency could also be suddenly recalled, during war for example, causing economic distress. The unifying effect of the gold standard meant that all participating countries were interconnected, which reduced their financial freedom to print and stimulate the economy or pay off external debt. Recently, a similar effect has occurred in Greece and other less economically successful countries using the euro currency. In leaving the gold standard, countries were once again free to determine their own monetary policy without hindrance. The French adopted a policy of free printing for reconstruction, which was necessary considering they suffered the most physical devastation of all the combatants. The war had left a large wound of devastation from one side of France to the other, around five miles wide, pocked with unexploded munitions and other such dangerous waste. Just as in Britain and Germany, a generation of workers had been wasted by the conflict. This led to inflation in France. Prices were up five times pre-war level, and by 1926, eight and a half times. More stable dollars and Swiss francs were then used by some in the country. The exchange rate of the dollar increased from five francs to 20 francs between 1918 and 1923. Prices rose for the consumer, but economic activity was very much increased, and steel production in the new French strait of Alsace-Lorraine had tripled in 1929 from 1921 levels. But the average Frenchman still wanted to see price stability. A new government policy of saving the franc and levying taxes came into effect in 1926, stabilizing the franc on the foreign exchanges. On stabilization, the value of the franc in relation to other currencies was much less than the accompanying rise in French prices, which made France a good place to buy from and a difficult place in which to sell foreign imports. 
This resulted in large gold influxes. France returned to the gold standard in 1928, blessed with much gold, but redemption was limited to amounts of 200,000 francs or more, well above that which ordinary French could afford. The value of gold had increased five times in francs that of pre-war levels. France continued to demand reparations from Germany, which undoubtedly led to the collapse in Germany. France tended to have a tendency to rise above all misfortune. Britain, being heavily reliant on external trade, had a more difficult to manage economy. Government spending was cut, the budget brought back under control, and unemployment rose to 12.6% in 1921. Churchill, the current Chancellor of the Exchequer, with the support of $300 million in loans from the Fed and J.P. Morgan, announced a return to the gold standard, as he assured to be followed by the rest of the British Empire. That gold could only be had for export payments was seen as a minor defect. There was an error in this calculation, though. The gold content of the pound was restored to pre-war levels. The exchange rate for dollars was too high. This meant that pounds were best used to buy gold or foreign currency, and used to buy foreign goods. Domestic goods had to fall in price by 10% before they were competitive, which led to falling wages, rising unemployment, and an unhappy workforce. The coal miners, a comparatively intelligent workforce, were most unhappy with the decline in wages. By 1929, unemployment was falling and output increasing at a modest rate. Then came the effects of the American Depression. In 1920, with wartime scarcity, American foreign loans and production at an end, prices leveled and began to fall. The Fed raised interest rates to 6%, causing America to enter the sharpest depression that had yet occurred, only later to be overshadowed by the Great Depression. It could not be said that the Fed passed this first test well. The Depression of 1920 to 1921 was to test the nation's wariness with unregulated banking and to show the inability of the Fed to manage such crises. Hundreds of smaller non-member banks failed. The Fed did not believe such bank failures were within its purview, and the state still lacked a watchdog for bank performance and rescue from bank runs. But the Roaring Twenties did not roar for all. The farmers, adversely hit by the 1920 depression, remained disgruntled. Farming commodity prices did not respond homogeneously with other commodities and had a tendency to lag behind any increases when compared to industrial or mining. Industrial worker output had increased by 43% between 1920 and 1929. Net income for a sample of 84 manufacturing firms tripled during the decade. This led to greater profits for the affluent, but not so much for the workers. Profits were often reinvested shakily in overseas ventures, using nebulous holding companies, which left the economic growth strong but fragile for the states. This was the precursor to conglomerates, performance funds, growth funds, offshore funds, and trusts that was to make a large feature in the 60s and 70s. The high profits of the period led to a stock market boom starting in 1924. The average of 25 industrials, which had been at 134 at the end of 1924, rose to 331 at the beginning of 1929, and 449 by August 1929. Individuals and investment trusts rushed to invest, going so far as to take credit from commercial banks to do so. Banks provided loans whose collateral was the stocks said loans were to buy. These banks borrowed extensively from the Federal Reserve. Thus, it is correct to say that the Federal Reserve was the ultimate financier of the 1920s boom. The Fed did nothing to stop the speculation and instead encouraged it. In 1929, the Federal Reserve Board of Washington, still having some autonomy, issued a warning against using Federal Reserve funds to finance speculation. This was much to the objection of the New York Fed, at that time directed by Charles E. Mitchell, previously head of the National City Bank and Chase National. Mitchell himself was heavily involved in the market and had little interest in seeing the boom collapse. The Washington Fed later added that what the banks did with their own money, i.e. depositors' money, was their own business. This was clear abdication of the basic responsibilities of a central bank, to keep lending under control. The board then deliberated several times in Washington as to what action was to be taken. The commercial banks were spooked and began to curtail stock market loans. The market tumbled. Mitchell made the national city commit $25 million to brokers' loans, and the market promptly recovered. No doubt this also served his own purposes. In the 20s, little was required to make oneself a central banker, other than that of appointment of to the role. In mid-1929, Paul M. Warburg, architect of the system and initial governor of the Fed, warned against unrestrained speculation. He called for stronger action by the Fed. By this time, however, his warning was of little use, other than to place him on the right side of history. The bubble was inflated and ready to pop. The crash occurred in October 1929. By 1932, the industrial average had fallen over 80%. Unemployment rocketed to 12.1 million by 1932, about a quarter of the workforce, from 1.6 million in 1929. 
Oil prices fell about a third from 1929 levels, but farm prices took an especially hard hit. Industrial prices had fallen 30%, but farm products fell a devastating 50 Here we see the break between farm economic forces and those of industrial. Unemployment did not fall below 10% until 1941. The depression of 1920 to 1921 was sharp but short. The depression of the 30s was sharp and very, very long. The Fed did little to stop the speculation of the 20s, and its poor decision in monetary policy continued into the 1930s. The New York Fed did lower interest rates from 6% in 1929 to 1.5% in 1931, but this happened relatively slowly, by which time the psychological effects of the depression had taken their toll on business confidence and investment. Spending and demand had dried up, partially to the loss of capital gains and partially to fear. People hung on to cash, and a vicious cycle of deflation ensued. The other Federal Reserve banks, exploiting their admired autonomy, lagged far behind. Open market operations, purchases of government securities to flood the commercial banks and stimulate spending, did not occur until 1932. Firms that had control over their prices sought competitive advantage by reducing prices of their goods by reducing worker compensation. Instead of prices pulling up wages and wages pulling up prices, prices forced down wages and every price cut led to further wage cuts. President Hoover responded with the National Recovery Agency to prevent the arbitrary reduction of wages as part of the New Deal to halt the downward spiral. Another notable deflationary force was that of increased tendency of bank depositors to panic and rush to their bank for their funds. This could cripple even the most competent of banks. Panic would also spread quickly to other banks. In 1931, the Ogden State Bank of Utah, hearing one of its competitors had closed its doors, made every effort to facilitate refunds to depositors to alleviate the panic. Staff were increased that day, money bought in from the closest Fed, and the bank remained fully open until all panic depositors had received their funds. Banking failures continued through the Depression. 659 in 1929, 1,352 in 1930, and 2,294 in 1931. These were mostly smaller banks, but in December 1930, the Bank of the United States also collapsed with a sizable deposit of $200 million. It did not help the deflationary pressures. The initiation of open market operations to increase lending occurred in 1932, but the Fed did not seriously take on the role of lender of last resort. If a bank was reputable and experienced a run, its assets would be examined with a detached eye by the Fed. By 1933, nearly half the nation's banks had disappeared. The lender of last resort was created by Hoover in 1932, called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation was slow to act, and runs continued, now tending to involve larger banks and spreading to entire states. Arbitrary excuses for bank holidays were made while the banks went to get refinanced by the RFC, such as was the case in Michigan in 1933 when all banks had to be closed for several days. The arrival of Roosevelt brought an era of reform to the Fed between 1933 and 1935, where power was consolidated in a single bank. Roosevelt also brought an end to the gold standard, despite large reserves still being held, and encouraged citizens to turn in their gold. This was an act of choice, and not necessity. What led to the decisive end to bank runs was the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Authored by Henry Stiegel of Alabama with a reputation for financial eccentricity, it provided for a government insurance of all bank deposits. The American Bankers Association led the fight against the plan with great vigor, arguing that this would incentivize reckless lending by smaller banks, but the provision passed with the rest in 1933, and no bank runs had occurred since. We now look at Europe in the wake of World War I. Germany and Austria were much afflicted by post-war inflation from printing to pay off reparations. Austrian inflation preceded the German running its course in 1922. The League of Nations came to assistance of the New Republic and also implemented fiscal reforms. At this point, the crown was worth 70000 to $1. Before the war, it had been 5 to 1. For the Germans, in the months following the war and establishment of the New Republic, the fiscal system was significantly strengthened. The previous imperial government had not had the power to levy direct taxes. This was now corrected and revenues increased from income taxes and the like. In 1921, revenues covered 90% of domestic expenditure. In 1922, the budget was even better for a short period. But two other serious problems remained. Government debt for the war had increased from 5 billion to 105 billion marks from 1914 to 1919. The second was that of reparations under Versailles. The eventual bill was 132 billion marks. It would need to come from a reduction in government spending and great increases in taxes. The German people were not willing to so stringently forego public and private spending. The bill of reparations was not fixed until 1921 and scheduling of payments was uncertain. 
Therefore, if the Germans showed a willingness to pay a large amount in the first year, this li would likely be continued, and the insuring annual claim would be increased. Milton Keynes was critical of the reparations in 1921, saying the requirements were far beyond that which the German economy could afford. The backlash against him was severe, and he only narrowly escaped financial ruin through loans from his publishers. The anticipation of reparations in Germany and ensuing inflation prompted the German public to scramble to cash in their marks for goods. Months after the reparations bill was set at 132 billion marks, the inflation began to hit. In six months, prices had doubled. By the end of 1923, prices had rocketed to the astronomical level of 1.5 billion times the pre-war level. The mark similarly collapsed against other currencies on the exchange market. The usual effects of runaway inflation occurred, more familiar today in the third world countries than those of Europe. Salaries had to be cashed immediately, and goods purchased with wheelbarrows of currency, as the currency could half in value overnight. Lending and saving stopped, as no banker would make a loan that would be worth only pennies once it became due, and no depositor would leave money to rot in a bank. The fire sale of assets in Germany, of those whose savings had become worthless, increased markedly. Bargain hunters had arrived, and it became so bad that all persons leaving the country had their baggage checked for treasure and forfeit it upon exit. In France, the bargain hunters were assumed to be Americans. In Germany, it was assumed that they were Jews. At the end of 1923, the old Reichsmark was declared no longer to be money. It was exchangeable for the new Rentenmark at a ratio of 1 trillion to 1. The new mark was declared to be backed by a mortgage on all lands of the Reich, somewhat similar to the Assignat of 1789, but with no physical confiscation of lands. The land standard of the new mark was fraudulent compared to that of the Assignat, but it worked nonetheless and the currency value stabilized. Lending returned and inflation fell from 25% in late 1923 to 3.3% by 1925. With the depression in 1931, reparations dwindled and eventually amounted to less than 6 billion of the original 33 billion stipulated in Versailles. When Roosevelt came to power in 1933 in the midst of the depression, it was clear that the prevailing deflation, arising from a general fear of losing livelihoods if money was spent, had to change. The clearest way to do this was to issue more currency. However, the conventional fear of inflation arising from issuing new currency that had spread from Europe in the wake of World War I left the political apparatus highly divided. The majority of economists and reputable bankers and businessmen remained faithful to these inflationary fears, and were against printing money. Senator Elmer Thomas of Oklahoma was a strong advocate of currency expansion, saying, we must have more currency in circulation. I care not what kind, silver, copper, brass, gold, or paper. The issuance of more money would have had the eventual effect of halting the gradual rise in value of money that often delayed its expenditure, in addition to increasing general liquidity. But to want to print money was to be branded as an inflationist, which immediately undermined political support. The turning point for the sound money men, the anti-inflationists, was the London Economic Conference in late 1933. At this time, some countries had left the gold standard, but others had not. The countries that had left the standard enjoyed the advantage of being able to siphon gold out from those who had not during trade. The United States, being a massive industrial producer, would benefit from going off the gold standard to lower the value of its currency and cheapen its exports, and Roosevelt made this happen. However, the expansion of the money supply during the Depression was not as simple as printing money. Money printed by the Federal Reserve between 1933 and 1934 had been used to buy government bonds, to pay government expenditure, and buy gold at increasingly high rates of dollars to the ounce. It should also be noted that purchases by the federal government constituted only 6% of the gross national product in 1940, a tiny minority. But this had failed to make anyone want to borrow, only succeeding in stimulating export sales and not domestic trade. The majority of money in existence is made when banks lend to borrowers to create new deposits. Even if the banks are providing money from the Federal Reserve, this does not mean that businessmen will be willing to borrow if the business outlook is bleak. Without an interest to borrow, no new money ultimately comes into circulation. From 1932 to 1934, bank deposits rose from $256 million to $1.6 billion. Here is where the economic theory of Keynes came into play. His theories had already been proven to stimulate the domestic economy in the policy of the Third Reich. Large-scale government borrowing occurred to fund public infrastructure such as canals and autobahns. In this way, the famous Austrian painter had found a way to fix depression unemployment before Keynes could explain why it occurred. Unemployment went down and inflation did not rise. Roosevelt's New Deal and other economic measures to mitigate the depression had some effect to break the stagnation and poverty of the depression. Between 1933 and 1937, unemployment fell from approximately 21 million to 14 million. 
these 7 million workers building new roads, schools, and other critical infrastructure. This showed a useful utilization of printed currency. It had another benefit of helping to raise the working class out of abject poverty. But the mobilization for manufacture of arms during World War II is most commonly thought to have brought the depression to an end, and the war economy dropping total unemployment to less than 2 million from the original 21. Now, at around 20,000 words, I have to bring this comprehensive explanation of money, banking, and economic policy to an end. As we can see, adequate circulation of money is critical for a functioning economy, and it is crucial that this money is stable and not subject to high levels of inflation. Currencies backed by gold, silver, or land worked well historically, but any scarce paper money can perform a similar role if printed judiciously. What makes money useful is scarcity above all. The ultimate role of central banks is to regulate private lending to prevent bubbles and sudden collapse of economies and to serve as a lender of last resort for responsible banks that have become victims of hysteria and bank runs. As economic events of the 21st century have shown, central banks are as susceptible as ever to politically motivated meddling, just as much as the First Bank of Amsterdam was in funding the declining Dutch East Indies Company in the 1700s, much to the detriment of its depositors. The creation of money to fund infrastructure and development has shown to provide great benefit in times of economic distress, such as post-war Germany and Depression-era America. The use of central banks is a great tool for economic development, when used judiciously. With all this, we can see that paper money and central banks can be used to great effect in rebuilding and regulating economies to ensure prosperity for all. It is only in the citizens' ignorance to such mechanisms that powerful men can enrich themselves and their friends at public expense. This is evident from the large wealth transfer that has occurred during the recent pandemic from trillions of dollars printed in just the last few years, and the inflation that the lower and middle classes are only just starting to feel now. Where we go from here is largely unknown. Whether we face an imminent financial collapse or a zombie economy that continues to limp on as anyone guess. Thank you for listening.